Thank you very much. The, the truth is that these days I'm in Berlin. Um, I put down that I lived in New York and Berlin when I wasn't sure where I was going to be living. And um, a few years later, you know, when, when the book came out about a year later, someone said that I was a greedy author and I had a lot of money because I obviously lived in New York and Berlin. So let that be a lesson to you, I guess, or, or me or somebody. I wanted to start by thanking you for inviting me to WIPO and the International Authors Forum. I'm a journalist by background. I, I wrote a book called Free Ride, and sort of a bit by accident, I became active on these issues. I, I thought that more authors needed to speak up, and not many were, more are now, so I decided to start doing it a bit myself, um, which is why I get all these people saying that I must be wealthy on Twitter if I'm moving between New York and Berlin, which isn't even true. I wanted to start by telling a story that shows you how the debate about copyright has gotten a bit absurd. In, in January, on Martin Luther King Day in the US, Slate.com, which is an internet site in the US, ran a story about how Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech has become locked up and inaccessible, and how this was a problem with copyright. The, the occasion was Internet Freedom Day, which uh, was a sort of a made-up holiday in the US that celebrated the anniversary of the SOPA protests. And the implication, of course, was that Dr. King's crusade was sort of, had something in common with the crusade against copyright. Um, you now, personally, I, I could see the point. I think copyright lasts too long. One could argue that it covers too much. But I also think it offers too little protection. I don't need the right to my work for 70 years after my death, but I would remind you that my work wasn't really protected until 70 years after my death. I found illegal copies online the day my book came out. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have, um, I don't mind less theor theoretical protection, I'd like to have more real protection. In any case, the article forgot to mention a few things about Dr. King's speech. First of all, the speech is not hard to find. I heard it growing up and saw it growing up, as did every American school child I know. When I was a kid, I'm old enough, this was before the internet. It was after the invention of television. I'm not that old, but it was before the internet. Um, in an educational context and in many other contexts, fair use would make it legal to show the speech, presumably. And in most other countries, I think limitations and exceptions of some form would cover that. One thing, another thing the article did mention, when this speech falls into the public domain, and I think it should fall into the public domain, there's another side to that. Not only will it be more accessible, but anyone will be able to run an ad against that or use it in an adver advertisement. So it will be easier to see, but we will also may have the Nike I Have a Dream ad. I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. Maybe other people are. The piece also forgot to mention that Martin Luther King was not only was he not against copyright, he was a copyright litigant. Anyone know that? Dr. King actually sued two record labels that released a recording of his speech. And the exact case hinged on some details that are a bit beyond me as someone who's not an attorney, but he won, deservingly, I think. He felt that he should make money on his work. I don't think he secreted that money away. I think he used a lot of it for his organization to continue his work. But I think he deserves the money more than a record label. I think most of you would agree. The other thing the piece didn't mention was that it was written by a Google lobbyist. And Google's obviously one of the companies that will, have, that will make more money when you can run advertising against the speech. I don't necessarily object to that once it's in the public domain. That's the tradition. But it does seem like information that Slate ought to have shared with people. This is just an example, there's a lot of arguments like this, but I think that the conflict over copyright that we see, we may not be getting the whole story. I do think there's two sides to it, but I think we're not always looking at it in the most productive way. We see it as a conflict between the past and the future, between greedy companies and generous companies, between rights and corporate power. But as all of you know, WIPO didn't start when the internet did. We've had this conflict forever. In 1842, Charles Dickens toured the US 
and lectured to Americans, he was angry that Americans weren't respecting his copyrights. I like to say that Charles Dickens was the Metallica of his day, which is a bit of an exaggeration, but I think my English teacher would get a kick out of it. Newspapers criticized Dickens heavily, much as blogs criticize people who stand up for their rights today. I think part of the reason, at least, was that newspapers were running Dickens' work for free and selling ads against it. And the only thing better than an advertising business is running an advertising business when you don't have to pay for content. Is this about greedy companies versus generous companies? Let's get real, all companies are greedy. I covered the music business for a long time. I can safely say that most of the people in the music business like to make money. I also covered the technology business. Most of the companies in the technology business like to make money. I think they should make money, I have no problem with that. I will note, however, that authors also like to make money. Authors, generally speaking, are not terribly good at it. My parents have roughly the same at it attitude as, as yours do. They didn't warn me about syphilis. I, they probably should have warned me that as a writer I would be, you know, spend too much time in a small room working by myself, that the greater risk was that I would never have a good enough social life where I could contract syphilis. Um, I'm married now, so that's a bit beyond me. But it's not as cool as it looks. Not only is it not as lucrative as it looks, it's not as cool as it looks. Rights versus corporate power. I'm a journalist, I treasure the freedom of speech, I treasure fair use and the exceptions and limitations that are its equivalent, but that's a right too. Few people seem to appreciate that that's a right. You'll notice that that's Article 27, parentheses two, I'm not sure quite how to say that. Parentheses number one is also important, it says that people have the right to participate in their culture. The balance between those is very important and I think we need to make sure the balance between them is upheld. But this is, I don't think this is about a conflict between access and creators. Creators want people to access their work. If, if no one accesses my work, I wouldn't get paid. Um, it, but this is also ultimately about a conflict between <coughs> creators and the companies that support them and invest in them and companies that want to distribute their work online for as cheap a price as possible. Let me just say, I don't blame companies for doing that. Every company wants to buy things cheaply and sell them expensively. Random House certainly wanted to buy my book cheaply and sell it expensively. I made sure I had a good agent. My point is that we came to a negotiation. What worries me is that I'm not negotiating with pirate sites. Some artists say they're fine with being pirated. I respect that. If they want to give their work away, that's the right. What I object to is there's no real negotiation there. If someone wants to give their work away, they should be able to do that. If they don't want to do that, that should be their right as well. One of the things that surprised me as I wrote the book was how many of the organizations that campaign for looser copyright laws are funded by technology companies. I said that I think everyone should have the right to give away their work for free. For that reason, I'm a big believer in what Creative Commons is doing. That said, creators ought to know that on that board of directors, there's only one professional creator. The vice chair of Creative Commons is the founder of Google's mother-in-law. I do support what they want to do, but I wouldn't <coughs> sign a contract that was designed by that group of people. I, I think Creative Commons needs to have a greater voice of the creators. Creators also tend to be dismissed. People say, well, this is just about record companies, book companies, film companies. And those groups have been more vocal, they have more money. But those, those companies also help us. I'll give you a short example. I was a, an editor at Billboard, I decided I had an idea for a book. I figured it would take me about two years to write. It took me a little less time. And I still missed my deadline. But how am I gonna get the money to do that? Am I gonna walk into a bank? I don't have any collateral. Well, I've never written a book before. I have a proposal. Oh, I've got like one chapter. And by the way, the banker, the next banker asks, and I say, well, most books don't make money. <coughs> About one out of eight books might make 10 times its investment. That's an estimate, but you get the idea. How am I gonna borrow money to do this? Well, in my case, I got a publishing deal. That's what publishers do. 
People say that you don't need publishers now if there's no printing, packing, and shipping. That's a logistics business. It's not even their core competence. What they do is they aggregate risk so people who want to spend a long time working on a book can do so. I think that's valuable. <clears throat> the other thing is that we hear a lot about the read-write culture we're in and that more people can create and how copyright sometimes gets in the way of this. I think that is occasionally true. I think it's rarely true. I champion the idea that everyone is a creator. I, I said that everyone should write a book. Everyone should publish a book. I just don't want them to publish my book. I like the idea that everyone writes a book. I feel like they'll have a little more appreciation for how hard it is. And I think that amateur creators want their rights. You know, you saw an uproar over SOPA, which was arguably too restrictive. I think it was too restrictive a law. I think it had some problems. But look what happened when Instagram changed its terms of service and said that we can use your photos to advertise. There was also an uproar. Everyone wants their rights to their work. Even if they don't care about their economic rights, they may want some form of moral rights. They don't express it that way. Very few people in, in the US, you seldom hear the term moral rights. It's right up there with socialized healthcare and things Americans tend to avoid saying. But when people upload their photos, they're not uploading them so they can be used in an ad. I think exceptions and limitations are important. We do need the balance between Article 27, 1 and 2, a balance between participation and your right to your moral and material interest. That's very important. I just think we need to make sure that the exceptions and limitations that we have are the exceptions and limitations that are in the public interest, not in the interest of companies that want to profit from creative work without investing in it. I wanted to um, share a quote about this that I thought was pretty interesting. I just found this a couple days ago. Um, I'll tell you who the writer is in a minute. And I quote, looking at my own motives, I want as many people to read and use my new treatise when it comes out, and money is not the motivation for doing it. But I never would have spent six years on the, this edition alone if Google could just scan it and make it available. I would have played my clarinet a lot more, gone out on weekends, many other things. I suspect others feel the same way. At the least, I would like to meet an individual who has worked for 12 years on something and says to the multi-billionaires who run Google, hey, take my stuff for free. I believe in culture, and culture means you guys can have it. Does anyone recognize that quote? It's a noted legal scholar, and I mean this, I respect him a lot, William Patry, who may have changed his mind on the topic. That was from his blog, which is no longer available online. I found it at the uh, Internet Archive, which is a source for all kinds of interesting, uh, interesting stuff. I'd like to just conclude by saying one thing, this tradition of remixing, which I just did. Um, one of the big opponents of copyright is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a serious organization. I respect them. I think they do some good work, especially on privacy. I do disagree with them about copyright. One of the most vocal people there has been John Perry Barlow, who's very much against copyright. And um, a few years ago, an economist wrote a book, and one of the things, he weighed the different things a while, talked about the new economy, the digital economy, and said, is Barlow right? Is copyright hopelessly outdated? We think not. One of those authors was Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google. So I just wanted to say, I think copyright needs to change a bit. I don't want to have some kind of repressive regime. I don't want to keep anyone from quoting my book. At the same time, I want to make sure that if people are building a gigantic business on the back of my book, well, certainly not on the back of my book, perhaps of books in general, you'd be lucky to build a small to mid-sized business on the back of my book. But whatever size business you build, I think it's only fair that the authors are compensated appropriately in the way where they can negotiate because they have some rights. And thank you really once again for inviting me. I really appreciate it.